Papua New Guinea and welcome to another episode of Business PNG. The Independent Consumer and Competition Commission under its Consumer Protection Division have taken steps to further address food labeling and product safety in Papua New Guinea with bans on non-English labeled products and certain baby prams and strollers respectively. The IEEC have warned consumers to be wary of purchasing dangerous items. Comparatively cheaper than established brands, packaged imports have become relatively popular in Papua New Guinean homes. PNG, like many other developing countries, does not have stringent requirements and standards for consumer goods, and in the absence of such standards, certain products can be harmful to consumers if not policed against. The Independent Consumer and Competition Commission, under its Consumer Protection Division, have taken steps to further address food labeling and product safety in Papua New Guinea, with bans on non-English labeled products and certain baby prams and strollers respectively. C imposed an interim ban on food products labeling on 31st March 2016. The interim ban uh, will remain effective for 18 months until 31st September 2017. In the absence of country-specific standards, the universal practice is for countries without homegrown consumer product standards to adopt the standards of other countries that best suit their needs. This is what the IEEC fears and has therefore placed the interim ban on non-English label food products on March 31st of this year and the ban will remain for 18 months until the 17th of September next year. The interim ban requires that all food products must be labeled clearly and the ingredients, name of packer, distributor or importer, address of the packer, country of origin and net weight must be labeled in English to ensure that consumers have access to basic product information. And you come across something like this, you know, come to us. You see, we can't be seen as a dumping ground by some countries. And Papua New Guinea is not a dumping ground for all these things to be dumped here. Now, we, we, we are struggling here trying to stop everything, but we, we are struggling. But we need a total commitment from the people of this country. Stand up, tell the whoever is selling us, tell him, what is this? Why do you have to sell us in our country? We, we, we need to, you know, this is the beginning of a, a struggle that we, 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 need, we have been struggling. So we are trying to put a stop to such practice. So, and if any business houses is, you know, trying to bring this one into the country, why would they bring it? The IEEC states that when a decision is made to impose an interim ban, suppliers and retail outlets sourcing and selling food products will be required to comply with the product safety requirements set out in the Commission's gazetal notices. Uh, we have a two-prone approach. One is to inform the trader consent that they're selling something that is a, a, a banned product, we provide them a copy of the Commission's gazetal notice and ask them to voluntarily comply. And the other approach that we take is we then take the offenders to court to prosecute them and make a case to the court to find them the maximum penalty of either 200,000 kina or two years in imprisonment. So that's the approach we're taking. Um, we are mindful of our role as the consumer watchdog. Uh, we have our challenges in terms of resource constraint, uh, but we are trying to be creative as to how we can enforce uh, the consumer protection laws we have in this country to ensure we have a certain degree of consumer protection so that the consumers at the end of the day are safeguarded and their interest is looked after. If business houses fail to comply with these requirements, the IEEC will not hesitate to prosecute businesses selling banned products to ensure consumers are protected and businesses abide by the law. According to Section 108 of the IEEC Act, offenders of the interim ban can be fined a maximum of 100,000 kina or imprisonment for up to two years. The cocoa industry in PNG is the backbone for rural economic development. The East New Britain province smallholder cocoa farmers were devastated by the destruction the cocoa pod borer brought to their cocoa farms in 2006. This has seen a drastic drop in their rural economy since. Cocoa is a highly essential export in PNG, 80% of which comes from smallholders. Over the years, the cocoa industry in Papua New Guinea has seen a major change in its structure, from big plantation production to smallholder farmers 
who now produce well over 80% of cocoa export in PNG. The managing director for NGIP EGMA Group of Companies, John Nightingale, said smallholders play a significant role in PNG's cocoa industry. An industry that was dominated by plantations from the 1960s, 1970s into the 1980s and, uh, and then a decline in the, uh, from the 1980s in the, the number of plantations uh, down to a very small number today. There's probably only five uh, plantations operating the whole of Papua New Guinea, five cocoa plantations that are operating today on a, uh, on a commercial basis. That accounts for probably 3% or so, uh, maybe 4% of the, uh, the total PNG cocoa crop and the other 96 or 97% is, uh, is all smallholders. So the smallholder is most obviously the very, very important or the most important uh, part of the, uh, the cocoa industry of Papua New Guinea. It's a smallholder industry and unless there's um, some unforeseen development that, uh, that allows plantations to increase yield to three and four tonnes a hectare, there's, there's, there's no real future for cocoa plantations unless the yield goes right up. So it's a smallholder industry, it will continue um, sustainably with the uh, correct uh, uh, policies in, in place by government. However, many smallholders in East New Britain province were devastated when the cocoa pod Bora or CPB struck in 2006, destroying the cocoa farms. CPB is the most serious threat to the cocoa industry, not just in PNG, but globally. Before CPB, you know, farmers were enjoying themselves. When CPB came, a lot of farmers gave up. Uh, some even lost income, and uh, you know uh, they have to find other means of support. An initiative called the Productive Partnerships in Agriculture Project, or PPAP, was put in place to help cocoa farmers. The PPAP program is supported by the World Bank, the International Fund for Agriculture Development, and the European Union. It is aimed at restoring skills, tackling the CPB by imparting management skills to the cocoa farmers and also helping to revive in the farmers the interest of cocoa farming, which is the backbone for rural economic development. Most of them after the 2006, and, uh, you know, they lost, they lost a, lot of, a lot of cocoa to CPB. They couldn't harvest uh, because it was infected and uh, there was a big drop in, in production. So most of them nearly gave up. <laughs> You know, they nearly gave up and uh, uh, some even left their blocks and they, they revert back to subsistence, you know, the small crops to earn a living. But uh, uh, thanks for this, uh, this assistance that have come in, why the, you know, the World Bank and the European Union, uh, this, these farmers are able to, I know, um, to revive and to revive the interest as well uh, because uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, they, they couldn't afford um, you know, new planting materials and uh, uh, they're lucky that they're in the program and they're receiving the, the planting materials free. The smallholder cocoa farmers now equipped with the skills and knowledge they need, they are ready to transform from subsistence farmers to commercial farmers. They're slowly seeing the fruits of the PPAP in terms of the high cocoa yields. This year is, is going to be, uh, or already proving to be, the, uh, the first year that people are seeing really good rewards from uh, their new efforts, new initiatives into, uh, into cocoa here in East New Britain and, uh, of course, in other parts of, uh, of Papua New Guinea. It's going to be a long uphill battle to get the, the, the volume of crop back to where it was and then beyond. But we are on the right track uh, and things are going very well. And the prospects for cocoa for the future are extremely good. They, uh, high prices are predicted for uh, many years to come. Other than 
the cargo growers of P&G should support P&G owned companies in, uh, in, cargo, in cargo exporting. Um, just about uh, every other exporter of any size here in P&G is controlled uh, by foreign people. Um, the profits are made outside of P&G, they're never made in, in P&G, that's a matter of public record. Um, this seems to be largely ignored uh, when licences are given and uh, we would encourage the, uh, the government um, and the cargo board to, to reconsider this position that, uh, that, uh, of licensing P&G owned companies that uh, keep their uh, profits onshore. The money stays in P&G and doesn't go to, to funding, in, uh, in one case, a, uh, a sovereign wealth fund in Singapore. Welcome back. Amongst the challenges of doing business in the country, there are some striving entrepreneurs who aim to succeed and propel their business from strength to strength. In this Entrepreneur Engaged segment, we feature a local hair and beauty company that are changing the hair industry in PNG one weave at a time. We present Mami Chakara. What no more in Mami Chakara? Mami Chakara came about because I, um, I myself braid my hair quite a bit um, and I noticed that I had trouble finding the kind of hair that I wanted here um, in the colors that I wanted, with the texture that I wanted. Um, so I decided that, you know, it was something that I could look into, maybe creating a line, a range of hair targeted at uh, not just PNG women but but Pacific women, so Mel Melanesian women primarily. We currently employ just two people. So we have a stylist, her name is Michelle, um, and we have a sales representative, her name is Eliana. So they are at our shop, uh, which is in downtown. Uh, it's in level two ANG house, uh, and we're located inside Yoshi's Clothing, uh, which is a family business also. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if you come by to Yoshi's Clothing, you can shop for clothes and you can also find your hair with us. Currently, we have um, our own range has about six, not has about, but has six products. Um, we have the Sia Braid, uh, the Arm Jumbo and the Congo Jumbo, uh, the Mali Mali, uh, the Joy Crochet uh, and the Lizzie Curls. So there are six products. We also have a Mami Chakra hair essentials line. We've released one product so far in that line and that's the Shea Butter. And it's basically organic uh, hair products for targeted at natural hair. We also have a, a range of weave ones. They're not our product, but we um, bring them in and, and we're a supplier. We've just started. Um, it's a fairly new um, venture for us, uh, so we're still learning a lot. Uh, but basically, it involved uh, finding a supplier and developing the product with the supplier. Then there was developing sort of the packaging with with someone else and liaising with the supplier to get get the product packaged and then uh, bringing it in. So we had to import it, uh, which had some challenges of its own, um, learning about you know customs and clearance and that sort of thing. So we had a bit of a hold up with, with that here because of some uh, issues that we've now learnt how to deal with for our next shipment. Uh, so that's 
that's the process we had to go through to bring the hair here and then you know finding a shop space and outlet to operate from um, we tried to do it just online initially but uh, we realized we also needed a space to operate from and thankfully Yoshi's Clothing uh, was able to provide us a space to operate from. I believe our fastest selling items are the Lizzie Curl and the Mali Mali. So the Lizzie Curls is a crochet style and the Mali Mali can be used for single braiding and you can also crochet it. So I'm wearing the Mali Mali right now so that's in a crochet style um, but you can also do twists with it. Before, the, one of the main impediments was um, actually securing the funding to to import hair. So it's very difficult. It was very difficult for us to get a loan for for the amount of hair that we wanted to bring in. So if, for us to bring in our own range, we had to hit minimum orders with our supplier, and then to hit those minimum orders, you're ordering quite a bit of quite a bit of stock. So we did. We did, you know, visit uh, NDB and that sort of thing to find out what our options were. Uh, we weren't able to get loans with them at that stage. It's something that we can do at least six months down down the line. That's what we've been advised. Uh, but we were able to source funding from, you know, family and friends. So that's how that's how we did it. Mostly family. <laughs> One of our greatest costs would be would be rental um, for the space that we have, and. So we, we are lucky in terms of we've, we're operating within our family business, so the, the rental is not as high for a prime location, uh, but that would be one of the greatest costs. We are also, we're slowly building up, so for example, we don't have um, the proper equipment yet for, for our salon, so we, we mainly we're targeting retailing the hair products. And, and if clients choose to do their hair with us, they do so, but we're, we're aiming to expand into providing a proper salon with all the, all the equipment and the range of services that are required. I believe Mami Chakra stands up from the rest because it's a product that's developed by PNG women who um, know what PNG women want from, from their hair products. Um, so it's not, it's not something that we entered into lightly. So there was a lot of discussion about the fibers of the hair that we wanted, um, the colors. And, and what sort of packaging we were looking at uh, to hit our target audience. So there was, a, there was a lot of thought that went into it. So that's, I believe, what makes Mami Chakra stand out. Uh, we really value or pride ourselves on the quality of the hair products we're selling. So far, our main medium has been social media. Um, we'd like to get into mainstream media, but I think that's something that will slowly come with you know, more sales. So it's, it's quite expensive. So that's another, another cost. I suppose is advertising is quite costly uh, in PNG, so you know newspaper or magazines, that sort of thing is quite expensive. So we're we're looking towards that, um, and hopefully we can get more advertising in the next next few months. encouragement would be to if, if you have a dream to um, to pursue it and it is quite difficult in PNG I know we have a lot of uh, stuff in the media and from government and from banks saying that they support SMEs and uh, there's a push to support SMEs and it's true it's out there but it's it's very difficult to actually access those services um, so it a lot of a lot of the groundwork has to be done by yourself, and and if you're if you're lucky to have family and friends that are able to help you out, that's actually how it starts. And
and then you can probably access the more the formal um, processes for funding and, and that sort of thing. But it's it's not something that's easily accessible still. There are the SME policies, but I don't believe they're easily accessible for the average Papua New Guinean right now. And that's all from us tonight. For more business news, if you would like to view this episode again, visit MTV Online at the URL at the bottom of the screen. Or for up-to-the-minute business news and updates, like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Business PNG or on Tumblr. Until next week, have a pleasant evening. I'm Leanne Girari and this was Business PNG.